Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Who would be a rugby pun today after a weekend like that? Six Nations, who knows what the results are going to be. Completely blew my mind. Got it the same in Super Rugby Pacific. All sorts of crazy results. Really competitive competitions as of the weekend. Seeing some interesting upsets. We're going to break into all of that as the show goes on. We're going to chat about who actually is the best team in the world. When you look at Ireland and South Africa, and then I suppose you've got New Zealand and France as well in there with them. A lot of chat online about that. We'll have a look at Super Rugby. We'll have a look at Opiki. We'll have a look at your comments and questions. And of course, the tipping comp where if you win our competition, you get a chance to come on the show as well. So before we get into the show, let's intro the guys. As ever, James Parsons. Who would be a tipster, eh? Oh, it was a tough weekend. I was about to hang up the rifle and say, I don't think I can come in all Monday. <laughs> Not many I picked, that's for sure. <laughs> Got the power, though. At Bryn Hall, tipping the Crusaders is a dangerous deal these days. You don't want to go 0-16 this year. Oh, I don't, I don't. So, yeah, it was, um, man, I think I had two picks. I think you guys all were the same as well, I think. Yeah, didn't get anything right. So, but it, it's great for the competition. I think rugby's back definitely in terms of the competitiveness of the competition. So, yeah, no good for if you're a Crusader fan, but um, great for the competition as well, though. Absolutely outstanding. Well, they've had a good run, those fans. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they paid their dues. Like, it's time for the fish to stop biting, right? <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll come back. They'll be there or thereabouts at the point end. <laughs> now, one of the big conversations we've seen online through the week, especially in the context of England beating Ireland, is who is the best team in the world? South African fans love to debate it. Irish fans love to debate it. We headed into the game on the weekend where Irish pundits were saying anything from Simon Zebo saying 35-plus against England at Twickenham to uh, <laughs> we had another pundit, who was it, Jamie Heaslip, saying that this Ireland team is compared to the momentum of the Carter and McCoy core All Blacks who won two World Cups. We've had all sorts of wonderful things. And then the Springboks are biting back, saying, well, you haven't won a World Cup. I think Robbie Fleck, Victor Madfield, all sorts of former Springboks, Joel Stransky, they're all into it. So let's get into it. The best team in the world to start off with, let's figure out how you figure that out. Because if it's about <clears throat> consistency, let's say over the last five years, that's one thing. Or is it winning the big games when it really matters, and who cares about the rest, which appears to be the South African mentality. I, I think it's hard to say who cares about the rest. That's the one hard thing for me, because in New Zealand and as, as an All Blacks team, the expectation is to win every test. So, But if you look back of our history and, and our struggles at the World Cup, we were always the most consistent team through that four-year period but couldn't get over that hurdle. So I genuinely do believe for two reasons. I still think South Africa are the best team in, this, in, in the world because, one, you're only as good as your last game, and that was a World Cup final win, and they haven't had an opportunity to present themselves. So I don't think they can go back. Mm. You know, when it mattered, they stand up. And, yes, their winning percentage, you know, through that four-year cycle is lower than most, but they also do probably test out their squads a lot more than other nations, depending on if players are in Japan or France or whatever. So they do use a, a, a number of players. And, and I mean, that could be a positive thing in terms of building that depth for the main events. Um, but Ireland are, as the All Blacks used to be, the most consistent currently in between that, you know, I suppose, that, that time between World Cups. So, Bryn, if you look at the stats, Ireland since 2020 have won 79%. France have won 78%. South Africa 69 and New Zealand 72% over that period since 2020. You know, try to keep it relatively recent. Ireland have won their last three games against the Springboks, including a World Cup win. Where do you stand on this? Well, I think, yeah, if you want to look at the stats, 79% and Ireland having the will over, over South Africa, but you'd, like we've talked about, the World Cup, whoever's the one of the World Cup is the best team in the world, I'm sorry. You know, there's consistency in everything and there's been times in New Zealand where we were the best team um, consistently for a long period of time but not been able to get the, the World Cup wins. But, you know, I think for me, South Africa have gone back to back. Yes, they don't get it right. Some parts in that four-year cycle, they rotate or they don't get the results of winning the rugby championship or anything like that. But when it comes to push and shove, they're the defending and two-time champions in the last eight, eight, eight years. So for me, it's the South Africans, but if you're going to go on percentages and around um, in between the World Cups, we've talked around a lot with Ireland, how consistent they are and the brand of footy that they have played has been um, has been world-leading, but coming to the big events, um, they haven't got the job done. So I'd, I'd go South Africa. I think if you like ask any player, they'll take a World Cup. It'd be interesting, you know, potentially to ask, you know, Goldie or someone 
um, that's that's here at Sky that would have, would have they taken the 95 World Cup win and you know lost a few tests in between that four year cycle? I think most people would take that World Cup win. Yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd like to think so. I mean, that tour in South Africa where they finally won. Yeah, 96. I mean, that was pretty big historically, and in comparison to a World Cup, probably harder to win. You I could think, probably argue, but yeah. And it meant a hell of a lot because it was the year after they obviously lost that that final. Mm. Um, so yeah, I still think yeah, I, I think everyone would want to win a World Cup, and maybe seventy nine percent is not that high though. When you think about it, when when the All Blacks were dominating that four year period, they were definitely 86 percent mm. in terms of that that winning percentage. So I was quite surprised, but I actually like that stat purely because it shows how tight international rugby is, and that's that that. As you mentioned before, that unpredictability of result is what engages fans a lot more. Well, and heading into this particular game, the idea was that the Irish results are actually predictable. They were scoring 30 plus, <laughs> they were winning everything. They were going to England, who apparently can't attack, were focusing on a rush defence <laughs> that they couldn't get right, Bryn. And then, <laughs> hey presto, England turn up. And I mean, Ireland pushed them hard, but they won it. Well, I think that's, that comes back to, the, I guess, the, the competitiveness of that Six Nations at the moment. I think it's the world-leading competition in terms of international rugby. You look at Italy over Scotland. You know, we talked around Scotland, obviously, trying to get that win. But, you know, Italy showed that their growth in the last probably, not just before the World Cup, but the new coaching regime that's come in has given them a belief. So, yeah, I just think at, at this time, um, when it comes to international rugby, there's just so many teams on their day um, that can win. And you look at England on the weekend, um, we'll, go, we'll go more around the Six Nations, but... Yeah, it's a great time for international rugby. A lot of teams are, um, are really competitive and um, hopefully continues for the next couple of years. Less is more. <laughs> Less is more. Don't, don't practice attack. Yeah. And then it comes to life. Are you quoting yourself? Yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm just doing a humble brag. <laughs> but it's not very humble, is it? Um, but, I mean, their attack came to life. And, and there are some key stats that Ireland, um, you know, lost. You know, England really matched if in some instances dominated the collision area, which just hasn't been the case um, for this Irish team in the Six Nations. When they bet France, they dominated France, they held them to sort of 32% gain line in, in that carry stat, whereas England had 50%. So one out of two carries you're getting across the gain line um, is pretty efficient against that Irish D. Um, so that was a big point, and that doesn't allow you to sort of set and put that uh, line speed pressure on and force those skills, and um, I thought um, England really looked to play. Hmm. Um, yeah. Probably the only time I would have liked them to play a little bit more was, I don't know when they, if you remember, but when there was the advantage and Ford took the pot drop goal. I don't understand why they've got such a great skill set in the air, like a little crossfield kick or a dink in behind. I just don't know why they... The drop goal, yes, at the last play, definitely take that, Marcus Smith, but I would like them to just sort of stretch themselves when it is that advantage to try and score some tries. Because mm. they're so comfortable going in threes, but they, they scored tries and they won test matches. So they've definitely shown they can do it. I think a lot of their shape was actually really good in, in terms of playing really flat. Ford was flat to the line. He had three or four um, outside him and had been able to pick runners when they were going forward. And then I thought, you know, Alex Mitchell, in terms of their, their speed of ball, being able to then play on top of teams was was a lot more. And I think, obviously, their, back, their, their fullback and wingers, I think, you know, they brought a bit of um, flair and, and X factor in terms of their ability to beat defenders one-on-one -on -one and get over their advantage line. So, yeah, look, I was I was thoroughly impressed. I know we talked around their defence and I think it's going to take a bit of time. There were a lot of, you know, there were times in that game when you look at James Lowe's second try, then when Slade comes out of that line, um, just trying to obviously bring that line speed pressure, but it is going to take a bit of time. But you, I did see a massive shift in terms of their defence. They were coming in very, very hard, very similar to the South Africans. And I think in time, you'd have to think if they're going to continue that, it's going to get a lot harder to be able to try and um, try and beat them defensively. But, Jim, there was one thing that I was surprised around there. I think knowing and with how the Irish, they adapt on the run, they didn't use their attacking kicking game. You know, Crowley and co. didn't look to, to try and get to that space where you did see it a lot. And I think, you know, sometimes with their shape, wingers aren't in that space, but there is a loose forward. So maybe, you know, moving forward, a loose forward might be able to be in those, see those pitches a little bit better because there was space to try and get there, which they didn't execute on the weekend. Ben Earl, Jim, oh. is a guy... Every time I've watched him play for England, he stands out. Like, I don't feel like people talk about him in the same way they talk about Savia or Aldrit, but he is a quality loose forward, particularly with ball in hand. Yeah, and I thought Underhill was really good as well, especially defensively, but Earl's work rate, um, 20 carries, 12 tackles, and, and when you've got a hot hand, you want to give it to these guys, but 
um, you know, he does need a little bit of support because <laughs> that's, that's a high carry and tackle count. He was second in the tackles and obviously first in the carries. Um, but he's an athlete, you know, when he breaks through that line, he's, he's just got great balance, um, great strength and, and a great explosive um, feed. I thought Lawrence was great as well. Um, and I really enjoyed Furbank. I thought at 15, he, he's, he's quick, he's rapid. Um, so some, some new blood coming through, I think, and, and finding, because that Lawrence performance is a little bit like the Tuolangi performance, you know, when they dominated the All Blacks, they, they really dominated that collision and got across that gain line and allowed them to pay, play with that pace. And um, yeah, we, I mean, they won by one point, so Ireland still fought well, even though they didn't play as well as I'd like, they, they pushed them to the end. Um, so it's not like, um, you know, I suppose England are saved, but, uh, 28 defenders beaten on attack. Like these are stats you sort of normally see in single figures for England. So they, they, they were great both sides of the ball. So there's plenty to talk about, I suppose, going into this last weekend where Wales will play Italy, Ireland will play Scotland and France will play England. The competition is still on the line if Scotland can get up. Well, they'll need bonus point, but... Yeah. Um, it would have been nice if they'd got the result against Italy. I know that's... <laughs> For Italy's fans, it's great, but it would have really brought some tension if it was just a win-lose scenario. Mm. Um, so they're going to have to chance their arm. And look, they chanced their arm against Italy. They just didn't, um, I suppose, get reward for the amount of ball they had, the amount of, um, you know, I suppose, offloads, defenders beaten, clean breaks. It was all there. Uh, they just couldn't get enough points. And, and maybe, similar to Ireland, maybe just expecting it was going to happen. And um, Italy hung in there, and they hung really tough. But also, when their opportunities presented, they, t they came away with a full complement of points, whereas, you know, I don't think Scotland would be happy, especially a Finn Russell side, to go into the 22 10 times and only come away with four tries, versus Italy five times for three. Yeah. You know, it's a big difference. Bruno, I feel yeah. like every time we talk Scotland up, they disappoint us the week <laughs> after. Yeah. Like, it is year on year on year, it is just the way they've got so much potential. I think this one probably hurts the most in terms of um, this result. I think, you know, the last couple of times it's been, you know, against Ireland or uh, um, in England or um, a France that they've kind of had the opportunity to win a game like that in a big moment. But I think this one, we were expecting them, considering how they've gone and the kind of, I guess, the praise that we're having for them in this competition, thinking that it'll go into the last round, which it still does. They still need a bonus point. But, yeah, they will, they'll be pretty disappointed. And I think, you know, look, in that first 30 minutes, you know, they had 72% of position. And I think it just comes back to the ability of them not being able to execute and the, the chances that they did have. Um, it just seemed like they were playing a little bit frantic and not as clinical and ruthless as they usually are. And to, to Italy's credit, look, there were a lot of times in that game where you'd have to say their talents would fold over. You know, the, Scot the Scottish started really, really well. They came back, you know, Scotland had their moments again, but they had that fight to be able to be, to be able to come back into the game. And so, you know, that's very, you know, we, we don't expect that from, from Italy. And so um, for them to be able to do that, um, hopefully this will leapfrog them now to where they have belief. I think most importantly that they can do it. And, you know, hopefully they have one more game. And then throughout the duration of the next couple of years, we're going to see an, an improved version of Italy because I think their attacking ability and their breakdown work and even defensively just moving and being able to be, in game um, consistently, um, it's much improved from, from the Rugby World Cups. So, yeah, great result for Italy. Let's yeah. have a look at this weekend's games then, because I suppose, I mean, Wales v Italy is by the by. Um, well, let's just say who you think is going to win that first before we get into the two games that matter for the championship. What do you think, Chip? I'll go Wales. Wales? Where's that being played? It's uh, a millennium, eh? Cardiff, yeah. Oh, man, the Italians were impressive. The They've been impressive the last two weeks. No, I'll back. I'll go. Um, I'll go Italy. Yeah. I've just been really impressed with the last two games. Well, the last, honestly, the last two games that they've played, it, it wins in any stadium. So whether they're able to do it um, one more time, I'm not too sure, but I've taken confidence the last two games. So I'll pick Italy. Superb. Okay, so then there's Ireland, Scotland. Yeah, Ireland win it. They win the whole thing. Uh, can you see them going down against Scotland in this game? No. At home. Losing to England, I just think they're going to be a better. Had they potentially yeah. beaten England and Scotland had won big, yeah. you'd probably. And I just think Scotland are going to give them a lot of opportunity because they've got to score tries. They have to get that bonus point. And as we've seen, the more rugby you play, the more opportunity you're giving because you turn the ball over and you're giving the ball back in a pretty prime spot in the field. Do you think Scotland will take that mindset? We've got to score the bonus point? Well, or is, or is, that, is that something where you, you take it once you've got yourself ahead? Like, how do you play that? Well, it's all or nothing. For me, it would be um, 
Yeah, I, I'd be going any penalties. I'd be going in the corner early. Try and yeah. get you, try and get them under your belt. Then you can play the tactical kicking game and threes yeah. and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's it's all or nothing. And I think look, they've got the perfect guy, <laughs> Finn Russell, to do it. Mm. Like yeah. if he has a day, he, yeah. he, they, this can happen. Um, but I think off the back of the England loss, um, this will be a razor sharp Ireland team. Mm. And they're going to need yeah. to win seven plus. Uh, you know they can't yeah. give a bonus point to Ireland. No, I think, True. but I think also as well. Like, I didn't think about that. I think yeah, I do. Think Ireland, will, Ireland will come back with a vengeance and being pretty disappointed. But you know, if you do look at Scotland and even on the weekend, the amount of ball that they did have, they 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 give a lot, or they make a lot of opportunities for themselves. So I don't think there's going to be a problem in terms of them being able to try um, put the Ireland team under pressure. I think there will be opportunities, but I think what it's but it's been like the last two, three years in big games, they haven't been able to take them. So they, they'll they know that they'll have to score four tries like the, like you guys are talking about, but they do have the ability with Finn Russell and the way that they do play, they're going to have an opportunity to score some points. It's whether they're able to do it under pressure, but in saying that, I still think Ireland, they'll come back after that review and you know they'll be a lot sharper and there'll be a little bit more steel, I think, in that breakdown, which I think they lost on the weekend against England. They're going to have to be more dominant on defence though as well. Like they let Italy get... Yep. 50% or 49% gain line. They still tackled at 91%, mm. like, but the tackles are passive. Like Ireland was mm. you know, 39% against England. Like they, were, they were physically met and put behind the advantage line. If Scotland sit and wait, and yep, 91%, I get it, is, is good, but if you're still getting over the gain line, you're making tackles, they eventually go over the try line. So um, they will need to show a bit of starch defensively as well. Yeah, yeah, and then there's the France-England game and all these two games, kind of, the results work concurrently to whatever's going to happen as far as who wins this championship. France at home against England. France are a touch of a mixed bag. Where does this go? Um, for me, this is... I'm going to need, like, a team naming situation. Yeah. Because um, the French will score points, so it's similar for England going into the Ireland game. Um, England away from home. Um, uh, I thought George Ford was good, don't get me wrong. I just think um, Marcus Smith could really open up this attack off the back of that, that performance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it would be hard to drop him after, you know, he sort of orchestrated <coughs> and then Marcus Smith had a good impact off the bench. So um, I think England would probably be the more secure bet mm. <laughs> if I was going to bet on them. Um, because you just don't know which French side, and, and they put a, they gave a lot of opportunity on the weekend, and uh, I just think England might have the better ability to pounce on those opportunities than Wales did. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, though, the French, when we looked at those stats we were looking at before, against the other top four nations, Ireland, New Zealand, and South Africa, actually have the best average winning percentage over the last five years against the top teams. <laughs> better than Ireland, better than New Zealand, better than South Africa. They are missing two critical ingredients. Yeah, that that's, yeah. that's true. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. So, uh, Bryn, where do you see this going, France v England? Yeah, it's, it's hard because I think, you know, obviously if it's with DuPont and Intermac, then I, I think that's an easy call for the French, especially being at home. But I think with the way that England are playing and especially how they did on the weekend, if they can replicate that and they'll have a little bit more time to try and um, get that line speed defence and get those connections, which I think is going to be pretty important against the French, they can score from anywhere, whether it's off counter attack or just in general the way with the offload game is. So I think the physicality and the breakdown, which they were able to do against the Irish and stop them and being able to, I guess, force passes under pressure is going to be really important against the French. And I think they can marry up both both games. They can have that attacking game and then if they feel they need to go into that kind of um, suffocating kicking game and effort areas, then they can go into that as well. But what I do love about the, the English team is their, their intent and everything they do is, is a, has a great mindset and it's 100% all the time. So when you've got a team that has that intent and mindset consistently, um, good things tend to happen. So I'll go the English um, to get the result uh, against the French on the weekend. Well, that's what we're looking at for the Six Nations. Um, let's move on to Super Rugby. The Chiefs against the Reds. Uh, amazing result. Uh, you know, the, the Reds were very good against uh, the Hurricanes the week before. They are a very strong side and they appear to be on the up under Les Kiss. But I don't think people saw this win over the Chiefs quite coming, 25-19. Why did you like the Reds? Um, well, they played to their strengths, didn't they? Um, and I, I think they defended 
um, at world-class levels, you know, <laughs> five penalties, 91% tackle, and it was about pretty much 50-50% possession. So they, they, they really um, matched the Chiefs' attack. Mm. Um, I do, I'm not sure, um, and it's not nothing on Joshuani, but I felt like when Sean moved back to fullback, their attack mojo, you know, he just has that extra bit of pace and found the way, because the Chiefs still got 14 clean breaks. They did get across the game line a lot of the time, but the scrambled D and the desperation of this Queensland side put in uh, that maul into context. Like, they have very, very good forward pack. Like, that maul's, it's almost like the Brumbies remember when Pocock was scoring about five tries a game. Mm. It seems to be pretty hard to stop. So they've got some assets there, um, and I think they're probably only going to get better and better you know, Les Kiss's touches are only going to get better and better on the squad and a lot of belief. You can see how much it means to them as well, how much they celebrated. Um, so for Bryn and I, we, we obviously picked top five uh, being New Zealand sides, but I think that's been thrown on its head um, dramatically. Even the Tars probably will feel that Highlanders game got away on them. And these Aussie teams are really, you know, stepping up. They are, they are. Yeah. And what could the Chiefs have done better to have been closer into that game and taken it out? You know, they had a lot of mistakes in that game. I think they had in the first half, or the, yeah, the first 40 minutes, they had, you know, 10 turnovers and seven handling errors, you know, so they, were, they weren't being able to be um, as ruthless as they were in the past two games. And I just think, I think defensively, the Reds did really, really well. I think, you know, the face play shift, the way that I've talked about with the Chiefs, you know, they ask a lot of questions, but I think connections-wise, I think on the edge with their centres and their their wingers and being, everybody being on the same page, um, even though the Chiefs weren't able to score because I think their own execution areas probably cost them. But, you know, in a lot of that time, um, they defended really, really well. And I thought, you know, the likes of, you know, McDermott, I thought Harry Wilson was, was energetic and at, at his best self. And I think being able to win that contact area with Udu as well. I think they've got a hard-nosed forward pack. I know Morgan Tirinuri talked around their forward pack probably being the weakest in the Australian, yeah. but, Australian but I think, man, out of, you look at the forward pack, man, they, they get through their work. Comes to line out more, where they've got a very strong set piece, they, they get into that 22-meter zone, but they're not afraid to go long phases, both defensively and on attacking-wise with their forward pack. So, look, I think the Reds, um, you know, they would be pretty proud of that performance, and I think, you know, it's honestly, I wasn't expecting after three rounds, these Australian teams to be where they are right now. So, yeah, it's really good for the competition, I believe, and um, especially the Chiefs, who we thought were going to be unbeatable for this weekend alone. You, know, so. you mentioned that phase play. It felt like sometimes yep. um, Josh and Damien were both at first receiver. Like, and it's like, you know, they've got so used to Sean just playing his fullback role and it's Damien's ship. And I just felt at times Damien was actually the second pivot out the back a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and whether that confusion of having that dual playmaker role just didn't quite suit the way their mojo had been and, and the way they were playing. Mm, we've uh, had questions about that in recent weeks, haven't we, about pure fullbacks versus the confusion of dual playmakers, and mm. there you go. Uh, yeah, I just... Um, it is a big change, like, because they are total different players, Josh and Sean, um, and, you know, if you look at the last two years, Sean's role has been pretty important in the success of the Chiefs. Yeah. Um, so you'd, you'd probably have to... And again, like, Josh is playing really well. Don't get me wrong. Like, he's, he's, he's killing it. But um, sometimes, you know, they say styles make fights. And, and it seems to be when Sean's at 15, he really does have that injection from the back. And, and he owns that. He doesn't try to be a first receiver. And sometimes it's just not your night. Mm. Like, that grubber kick. I mean, I know McLaughlin Phillips is a talent, but that was just the most unfortunate bounce ever. Yeah, it was. Um, for um, Coombs' family. <laughs> so um, there are sometimes it's just not your night. And I do think the error count is always high with New Zealand teams when you go to Queensland. Bryn, you'll know this. The humidity, yeah. the ball is just like soap. And especially in that first 40, you know, 11 visits into the 22, two tries, that's just not Chiefs st standard. But it's actually really, really hard to control that ball. And, um, maybe just yep. tried too hard. Even that knock on over the line, I think it was Tupo Vai, um, you know, just dropping the ball. Um, and it's just that greasy nature. Had they been in Hamilton, it's probably nowhere near as challenging. Yep. Get those Tony Brown, Byron and Keller gloves <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah. Wouldn't you ever played with gloves on? No, nah, man, my dad wouldn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> Mikey Harris was a big fan of the gloves. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah, big fan of the gloves. Well, he played over in Brisbane for a while. Did he play with them when he was there? I don't know. He must have. Well, he always did with Harbour. Yeah. Hell of a, hell of a setup. I think he even nipped the fingers off. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Certainly in cricket, I always played with the batting gloves, with the inners with them nipped off. Oh, did you? Yeah, just the... Just to better, release a bit better, of moisture. Better feel. Better yeah, feel nice. through the fingertips. Not nice. that it helped me score runs. Yeah. You know, but, <laughs> hey, but you felt good. But I looked good when yeah. I went out there with the appropriate equipment on. Yeah. Um, always. Uh, so, <laughs> before we move on, the Reds are a really interesting outfit. You know, if they get a win this weekend, and let's say that the Crusaders get up for their first win and beat the Canes, the Reds could well be on top of the table. And I don't think anyone saw that coming. We caught up in the preseason with Reds captain Tate McDermott to ask him a little bit about what they're trying to achieve as a side under Les Kiss. Hey. Well, mate, before we get going, let's let's talk about you got a new coach, Les Kiss, coming in this year. Obviously highly experienced over in, in Europe. How has that changed the way that you guys are doing things, that, that influence that he has from his time over there? Yeah, things are very different. Um, obviously, the way kind of Thorny saw the game and the way Les sees the game are, are, are a little bit different. Um, yeah, he's kind of built on those foundations that Thorny laid for us. And, uh, yeah, I guess that kind of style we saw with London Irish, he's, he's brought that across um, and he tied it into our... I guess, yeah, when we're playing good footy, our DNA, we, we've got offloads, um, we've got boys playing free yeah. free, and, uh, you know, expressing themselves. So uh, we saw 30 minutes of what we're capable of uh, in our trial match on the weekend. Um, but I guess, yeah, for, for us, it's just about having the confidence to, to really be aggressive with our style of play, um, testing teams in those wider channels. Uh, and, yeah, um, yeah, mate, it's exciting. You, you are obviously... Um are a key cog for uh, Queensland, and, and I suppose nine and ten is critical. But ten, there's a little bit of a logjam. Um, you know, looking at sort of the, you know the preseason first few rounds, who do you who do you think will get the nod there? Yeah, I, I mean, you've got the experience of James O'Connor, um, and then you've got three young fellas nipping at his heels. So I think uh, Harry McLaughlin Phillips is in a, is in a really good place at the moment. He uh, he's positioned himself well with a couple of good performances. Um, but then you've also got guys like Tommy Liner, a world-class goal kicker, um, a great boot, and, and Lawson, who's a great communicator. So yeah, we're lucky we've got those guys there. Um, we've got depth in that jersey, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I think Harry is the front runner, but we'll see, see how we go. What, like, we obviously know a lot about O'Connor and um, I suppose a little bit about Liner, but Harry, what, what is his strength? Is he flat to the line, or is he a, a tactical kicker? Is... Yeah, he just takes the... Takes the um, you know, the defence on all the time. Um, so, flat of the line, uh, makes good decisions, um, but it, Benny's a natural runner of the ball. So, um, I guess probably the most similar to, to James. Yeah. And uh, I suppose James played a little bit of 12, and, and I, I'm pretty sure he played 12 against the win you guys had against the Chiefs. And tactically, his kicking that night with, with around those 50-22s were the absolute weapon that probably gave you the ability to get that one. Yeah, I mean, James is a, is a talented player. Um, and, and like you said, he's experienced. He knows when to kick, when to run. And um, he's been really good around Harry's development at 10, um, teaching him those intricacies that maybe he didn't have at the start of his career. And um, it's great to, to see him giving back to, to Harry. Um, and it's only going to be good for our team. If there's one person in your squad that he's got a man crush on, it's Fraser McWright. Oh, yeah. Can, can Please, you tell yeah. us that he's not perfect? Is there something about Fraser McWright that isn't perfect? Ah, uh, <laughs> there's a bit. I don't know if I can say much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like him even more now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he ticks all the boxes. He, he, he is exceptional. And what I refer to him is he's almost a young Michael Hooper in terms of his game style. He's got the ability to impact the game on attack, ability to do it at the breakdown defensively, and he's a leader by the sounds, you know, not only on the field but off it. Well, in all areas. Yeah, yeah, in all areas. But I think Fraser, he's, he's brilliant, man. Um, he's one of those players that he's an absolute workhorse, but he always just pops up around the ball. Yeah. Um, you know, he can smell those opportunities before they've even happened. Um, so he's got that rugby brain that um, I guess you're saying Michael, Michael Uber had it. Um, and he's probably, to be fair, he's probably modelled his game off Michael Uber, um, given how good Boots was. Um, so... Uh, he's a leader in defence, attack, um, and he's, he's a crucial cog in our wheel. Now, we're talking with all of the teams a run a straight challenge. <laughs> Who is the person you'd least like to run a straight at? But we thought for a halfback we might switch it up. Who is the person you'd back yourself running it straight at in Super Rugby? 
Uh, probably Darcy Swain from the Brumbies. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I love, love that. Yeah. <laughs> Might end up in a coffin. Yeah, he's obviously pretty popular in New Zealand as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's, oh. he's highly loved over here. Oh, the, the fan club's over in the oh, corner there. Waiting. I call good half facts. He's short of a short of a jam. <laughs> Cocky Aussie halfbacks, eh? <laughs> Running at a big bruising forwards and thinking they'll get away with it. <laughs> Bryn, you and Artie? <laughs> no, not me, mate. <laughs> not me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he won't be doing that. Now, one of the most interesting things what's come up from uh, the last week is Kevin Malloy, the Super Rugby chair, talking about opening up player movement within Super Rugby. His hypothetical was Artie Savia maybe playing over in Australia and how that'll affect the landscape of the competition. Probably make it look like other sports competitions in the world rather than being so inwardly focused within each nation, considering the All Blacks policies for selections, etc. That's why it's gone that way. We also had an email, and we appreciate your emails. Please email us at aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz from Winston Stowers. Um, he also sent a very similar message the week before on YouTube. So, Winston, glad we can finally get to your question. We keep talking about stronger and stronger Australia teams. What do you think if New Zealand rugby expanded the selection for ABs into the whole competition, allowing for some of our players to get time starting in Oz, who would, might have been on the bench here, allowing more options for us across the board as New Zealand? Marquee players within a salary cap similar to the NFL could make the competition interesting and would allow us to see new combina uh, combinations across the board. Bryn, what do you think of that as a concept? Is it something that this competition needs? Uh, just a clear no for me. I don't think it does. I think considering, I think when this was first talked about, it's because obviously the competition of the Australians and the Super Rugby Pacific weren't up to par, but I think with how you have to think the direction now with, um, you know, we talked around the Reds and even the Waratahs and, you know, the the, the teams performing now. I don't think it, it, should, it should be opened, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's it's quite cheeky on the Australian side to try and um, bring in some some New Zealand players that are obviously playing at a high level and obviously um, are within the All Blacks environment. But no, I just think there's too many things that shouldn't be done and I think that's one of them. They're not, you know, getting the best New Zealand talent going to Australia and trying to help them out. Hearts is no because, um, you know, depth is a... With even Moana Pacifica coming in, the talent pool depth has shrunk. You've got MLR taking, you know, I suppose that sort of replacement player pool. But in saying that, unlocking the Australian market in terms of engagement, much bigger, um, and the opportunity to grow the competition, um, something like this potentially could be the key to doing that mm. um, and and getting, I suppose, Australian fans back engaged into Super Rugby. Um, so I think it would have to be marquees. I, I would be disappointing to uh, see players that may be on the bench going over because I think we've seen that mm. with the Rebels and the Force and it hasn't worked. Chase tier tier, it's yeah. yeah, and it's not going to... It's not going to do the job what I think Kevin Malloy is hinting at mm. and that would be eyes on our game. Um, so those marquee opportunities, potentially, um, but selfishly, no. Uh, I, like, I'd be mm. devastated, say, Rico signed for the Waratahs and left the Blues as a Blues fan. Yeah. You know, like, it would, it would cut me. And saying that, we're more than happy to see Pablo Mateta come and play for the Crusaders. Like, it is, you know, we like it the other way. Bryn, you know? Not necessarily. Sometimes I feel like that's taking an opportunity for someone that's been around. Yeah. So I'm not quite sold on You're that. Not 100% either. on that. No. Mm. Only like in the sense that there is absolutely no one, and there's you know it's too early to just throw someone in sink or swim. Get that. Totally yeah. understand that. Um, mm. But trying to keep our talent and um, keeping every spot available. Um, but again, that brings eyes to the game. So like I'm. Sitting on the fence here, which is very rare, because on one side I want us to win and I want a New Zealand team to win every time, um, but I understand we've got to change something to get our game. And, and like you look at the weekend, you know, rugby's back, you know. I, I genuinely believe that. Like I was in, in shock and, you know, you, you start yeah. reading deeper into the games and how other people saw it and, you know, it's, it's not just like, oh, yeah, there it goes again. 
Yeah, you'd love a bit of Fraser yeah. McWright in the blues. Oh, I would. I would. How good is he, man? <laughs> is he like the support line king? <laughs> like, seriously. It's like, honestly, as soon as... Um, I actually, on that note, I thought Vinavali was outstanding. I, I had a bit of a crack at him <laughs> last week saying, get off your wing and do some work like Mark Talia. And he, he stayed on his wing when he needed to and he came and got engaged and, and freed up um, through that midfield a little bit. Um, but, yeah, McWright. <laughs> yeah. How good. <laughs> Just like... A one-two punch with Dalton Papali'i at the Blues. Oh. You would, you'd be a big fan. Oh, I don't know. The uh, only concern there as a hooker is the height and the line out. So <laughs> yeah, there's a few things to weigh up. Yeah. Maybe Dalton go to Queensland and, and Fraser can come to us just, to, just as a sense test. <laughs> just test it out. <laughs> and so, well, what, Ozzy, would you like to bring into a Kiwi side then? I don't actually know if that's off the top of my, off the top of my head. Who's someone that's running around that I really would like? Probably a Taniyala Tupo. I yep. think he'd be a good one it's, to bring in. I think considering that he was, at, he was at Sacred Heart, he was at Sacred Heart as well and having that New Zealand connection. But yeah, I think he's one guy in Australia is that um, has that superstar power. And I think in the right environment, I think the Crusaders wouldn't mind him right now. So yeah, Taniyala Tupo coming to the Crusaders wouldn't be a bad option actually. Let's talk a little bit about the Blues and the Hurricanes. Hurricanes got up 29-21. Uh, it certainly wasn't picked by us, but the Hurricanes are Bryn's dark horse for this whole competition, so possibly pricked by Bryn as well. They made a big decision to go with a 6-2 split. They copped two HIAs to their two backs, and next thing you know, they've got a halfback playing on the wing, Bryn. What did you make of that decision? I mean, we've seen the Springboks win with it, but geez, you're rolling the dice. Oh, well, that's it, isn't it? If you have a 6-2 split or a 7-1 split, you know, as coaches, you just don't bank on them getting in, injured. And the fact that it happened in the first 15 minutes um, and you had, a, had, a, had a, a nine playing on the wing, not just more so on the attacking side, it's obviously there's a lot of um, things that go with being on the attack, but the defensive side, you look at the ability of them being able to score a couple of times at Funaki and, and um, fullback. Who was the reserve uh, fullback? Chipper, what's his name? Forbes. Forbes, they, they went on the same guy. And so, you know, whether they did the what in terms of like defensively of what his role might look like, but yeah, there's just a lot of things that come with um, having that 6 2 split. And you saw that on the weekend with Funaki, who I actually thought, considering, hasn't played a lot of winger, um, you know, did his job, you know, pretty well considering. So I just felt, could they have split them up? Hmm. I just felt the poor guys just were like, like defensively, it is hard. Like attacking wouldn't yep. have been an issue. Everyone knows attacking, they'll know, know their role there. But defensively, I think that's where it was showing up, and it's no fault of theirs because defence, as we spoke about England, it's reps, mm. you know, like, and, and sometimes they both jammed on the same player and then one held off and one shot, and, um, and the Hurricanes were too good. They, they, they just kept going there. They, they knew that that's where they could test them and, and they got the full reward Which and a little bit of freakishness from Naholo. Yeah, just, sorry. Just, just on there, like an example of that, Jip, you know, with the winger, and we talked about it before we came on air around, you know, with the winger, Mark Talia defends in that, in that first channel right next to the to the line-out more, and it's been able to just, you know, why would you not put Funaki in and around that area, which is, you know, it's very similar for a nine to slip in just outside the ruck, outside the mall, and then have Mark Talia play both sides of the wings and trying to help out in that terms, especially when it comes to, you know, line-out strikes close to the line where that 13 winger is on in 15, it's really hard to defend. Massively, and it's that kick space as well. Yeah, you know, like, um, yeah. I just think maybe, yeah, just it's so unfortunate. Mm. Um, and look, I still think they fought well to be in it, but um, it almost felt when that happened, the Hurricanes grew an arm and a leg, and 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 there was some brilliance though as well. Like Kenny Naholo's performance was pretty. You could beat a man. Yeah, yeah. He's um, he's just getting better and better, and. and you know, between him and Tava Tava Nawai, <laughs> proving to be two of the hardest men to stop, and Sivu Reese as well. Yeah. I thought Sivu was outstanding. Mm. And Ravu Tamanda. Yeah, oh, he, <laughs> he, okay, he wins. Yeah. He wins, actually. He's, He's so good. He is so good. Man. So is that incredible. Your, what's your top five look like? Top five players who are impossible to tackle? Uh, yeah, I, look, Tava Tava Nawai is in there, and Naholo. Um, I reckon Parisi's pretty. He like had a when he's great fit, game on the weekend. When he's fit, he is. A, he's an explosive athlete. Mm. He would be. He would leave someone like me at sea. Um, <laughs> who else is Cam Royer is proving hard to put down just to get a mention oh. for my boy Cam. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. What do you think, Bryn? I reckon it would Tomata. Yeah. That guy. You can't stop. Oh, yeah. He's so, he's so fast and so explosive. And you look at that try that he scored on the weekend, like, you know, he had no right to score that. And that kind of small window, that wasn't in terms of like how he usually is with the speed and you show, it shows how fast he is. But his ability to be able to beat that defender with strength and footwork, yeah, gee, he's he's a full package, I reckon. I love, I love watching him play for the Fiji in the draw. Braden Yossi's another one, actually. Yeah. He's, he he Ooh, just seems to always break a tackle. Yep, he's very, very strong. And I look, I, we're obviously talking about other stuff, but man, how good was, was Ruben Love yeah. as well on the weekend? Jeez, if we talked around it a little bit earlier around the fullbacks and with Will Jordan being injured, I think he is just growing so much in the past couple of couple of weeks. I think his distribution jump under pressure, I think, you know, that's a big part in terms of how the attacking game is at the moment, especially trying to get that ball to the whip. I think arguably you'd have to say in the first three weeks of the competition, he'd be the best guy to get that ball away under pressure. And I think he had three tries on the weekend and we know his attacking ability, but I think as a run pass kicking even defensively, oh man, he's he's having a hell of a start to this year. I tell you what, I did some work on the weekend with Goldie, and he was—he's a big Ruben Love fan. Is he? Like the, the, he's a hard man to impress in that back three area, and he was—he was saying he reckons he could have been the difference to beating. And he picked the Canes. He said, "I think they're the sleeper. They'll—they'll they'll beat the Blues." Um, but yeah, I think his ability to get that ball away, and what I like about the Hurricanes as well, similar to the Chiefs when Sean's at fifteen, they've got clear roles. Like yep. it's Brett Cameron's ship, and you inject when you can. Um, but it's very, yep. very clear that calmness of Brett Cameron, Brett Cameron is critical to getting their game going. He kicks good goals. Yep. No, he's very good. He's, mm. he's actually a fantastic fit for the X factor that is in and around him. Yeah, yeah. Not that so he good. doesn't have the X factor, it's more he just has that calm and composure. And he's another player that he's never inactive. Like, if you watch the good first receivers in behind that forward pod, but always a game. I was talking to Aaron Cruden about it um, at the Rebels won a Pacifica game. Mm. And I was like, you know, my biggest frustration as a forward is if I'm here and you're not active out the back, defence is like, oh, we're just going to tee off on you. Yeah. You know, like, because sometimes they're like out here organising this. And he goes, he goes, he used to pride himself. Aaron said, I prided myself on always being there. And he said to his ball players, he goes, even if you don't, if, if I don't call it and you think it's on, you put it there, I'll be there. And he was like, I was religious on it. I would always be there. And it creates opportunity and it gives the player with the ball confidence um, to make a decision and pull the trigger. I thought it was really interesting. Like he would, he would, and if, if he wasn't there and it went, he would always, you know, put his hand up sort of thing. So um, it, was, it was very interesting because Brett Cameron's very similar. He's always engaged. He's always active. So you have to mark him. Mm. Sort of like Mwanga yeah. used to do. Wonga would always go out the back outside that forward tip runner. They're always the best tens because it just makes it so much harder. But also, you know, if a, if a Yossi's there or you know a Karifi, or, you know, it gives them the or an Almoa to just bloody you know go after it and then so, then mm. open up that little mm. pass out the back. Let's switch from the Crusaders, the champions of Super Rugby, through to Opiki, where Mata too, the champions of Opiki, are also having a really tough time. It's, don't know what's happening in Christchurch right now, but it's it's not going well, Bryn. Uh, they lost to the Hurricanes Power. Now, you picked it. 36-29 <laughs> yep. to the Power. A game with the Power coming in after, you know, a fair bit of media coverage during that week. And to put on a performance like that was, was quite a performance. It was impressive, but, you know, <laughs> this is the one pick I probably got right. <laughs> that was, I suppose, um, ambitious. Um, for most, but what I saw live against the Manawa man, like you knew they had talk about set piece, good defence, um, great around the breakdown. They had all that. They've got all the ingredients there. Um, and look, Matatu still pushed them. I mean, it was equal level pegging going into the last five minutes, so it wasn't easy. But um, yeah, some of their stats were, were outstanding. 60% of the time over the game line. They've got some really outstanding midfielders. Shakira mm. Baker was great oh, yeah. um, on the weekend. Uh, really, I'm really a uh, big fan of the two kings. Obviously the first five, but the, the loose forward, blindside flanker as well. Um, like not big in stature, but poor, they, they get into their work and not afraid. Um, so yeah, no, there's a lot to like um, and, and a potential finals berth. Mm. Uh, looming for them. So, uh, I mean, that battle um, with the Blues is going to be interesting. Because the Blues probably let one go 
if, if we're being honest yeah, with you know, in terms of opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's very rare you see the Manawa with 26 turnovers. Previous week, week nine, yeah. nine turnovers against the Polo and, and they were pushed hard there. Um, but their defence saved them. That goal line D in that first half, how the Blues didn't score, I don't know. Like, yeah. there's this one tackle of, watch the replay, of Luca Connor. Um, I think, uh, I can't remember, someone picks up in dummies from the Blues and like, every, like the rock shot off there. Yeah. So it's like, in my head I was like, oh, this is try time. Boom fa. What do you mean the rock shot off? Um, the defender that's right by the breakdown sort of fell for the dummy, went out here, and Luca Connor just slipped in here and just yeah. crushed her. <laughs> it was, it was impressive. And that, and yeah, um, some great pressure through the midfield. Steinitz was, was outstanding. So it was a defensive win. Certainly wasn't an attacking win for, for the Manawa. The Blues, Bryn. Silly errors, charge down conversions, crazy plays off penalty kicks, bring it back into touch when they didn't need to. Um, unforced error for that possible lake equalising try, just lack of composure, just across the board. Yeah, I think that's it. I think, you know, considering, you know, I probably thought the Chiefs would actually be doing a little bit more comfortable. But I think the Blues, in hindsight, if they get them again in a semi-final, final stage, they'll know that, you know, they made a lot of unforced errors and probably should have, and should have won that game. You know, you look at that last passage of play where, you know, the reserve halfback comes on and you know, it's, it's a little knock on there. But that was kind of the recipe, I think, for the whole game. They put the Chiefs under a lot of pressure and they did make uncharacteristic mistakes throughout the lot of that game, the Manawa. But, you know, the Blues were able to do that with the way that they were playing. And so the composure, I think, you know, they didn't get that right. But they will take, I think, they'll take a lot of confidence in knowing that they can. If they get it right, a little bit better, you know, they don't have to do much better. Um, but if they get it right, they'll, you know, they'll back themselves knowing that that experience that they had, that they should have won that game, Give them belief going into that semi-final final stage against like a Chiefs Manawa. I think they're they're frustrated. Mm. They that was there. That'll frustrate 100%. them. Like um, you know, just I, I was sitting um, next to the Blues coaching box, and you could sense a hell of a lot of frustration because they they just that was their their moment. Yeah. Now we did have a request online for people overseas who trying to figure out what's going on within Opiki for where these franchises are from. So the Blues women are with the Blues out of Auckland. The Poa, they're the Hurricanes team out of Wellington. Chiefs Manawa, the Chiefs team obviously based out of Hamilton. And then Matatu is a combination of the Highlanders and the Crusaders. So that's for the overseas viewers, the makeup of these four teams within Opiki. Um, there was a question online, so um, appreciate that question. It's good to clear those things up and make it easy to follow. Super Rugby Tipping. Please join our <laughs> Super Rugby Tipping competition, our league, our Aotearoa Rugby Pod League. It was a bloodbath <laughs> on the weekend. Didn't go well for a lot of people, apart from a bloke called Delta Hurricanes. I can't believe Who got five How's right. he done it? That is unbelievable. Nah, how have you done it? You must have yeah. two. And, and, you must have two. And two. I know it's not luck the way that, because I forgot to make my, my picks, yeah. and I only got two. And I think if I'd made my picks, I would have only got two anyway. It just yeah. randomly went the other way. Yeah. Um, but it had to have been choices. It can't have been luck of the draw. No, no. Um, five. I just would love to know which one he missed. Because if he's picked the Reds, that's a hell of a pick. Yeah. Hurricanes I can get. That was always going to be 50-50. But that, that sort of Reds win, um, yeah, I think it caught everyone by surprise. Yeah. I suppose the Hurricanes as well. Right, right. Now, if, if you win our Super Rugby Tipping competition, at the end of the year, we'll get you on the show. Let's have a look at who we're picking this week. Bryn, the Crusaders against the Hurricanes. Crusaders at home. Does the winless streak end now? If they can't fix up the areas that we did talk around with their set piece and um, the execution areas and not being able to make as many mistakes, they have shown in that Chiefs game that they, when they do get it right, um, there's belief that they can get it done. So the, the, the Hurricanes will be buoyed with their with their start and being the top of the table and being undefeated. But um I'd like to think that the, the Crusaders will will get a few things right and um and be a better result. So yeah, I'm hoping. Is that glass <laughs> it's, it's it's more than half full, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, look, I'm gonna go to the Canes purely we didn't touch on it before, but Stephen Peterfeta had nineteen carries. That's a that's a high carry count for a first receiver. And that's purely from that rush defence that Corey Jane loves um, and really gets in that eye line. First receivers push them back where they want, take them out of the game and it just stems the flow. So um, if Kemera or Havili is at ten, that that'll be 
the manipulation of that, especially early with potential kicking game, will be crucial if they are to win this. Um, because that, for me, it was a big defensive win and a big reason why the Canes sort of stunted the flow of the Blues. So uh, I think they'll get it done against the Crusaders. Cool. Rebels against the Reds. 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 All day. Reds. Reds. Yeah. How Reds. did you have to think about that? Well, the Rebels have got two wins, admittedly against two pretty average teams. Um, but they, they are currently sitting in fourth place on the table. They will have to be much, much better to beat the Reds. Yeah, they will do. They will do. OK. Force against Moana Pacifica. I've lost, I lost faith in Moana Pacifica. Yeah. Yeah, I picked the force on the week. On, oh, sorry, I picked the one on the weekend, and I just think, yeah, um, just losing faith in the fact that you know, they give you a little bit of confidence with that result over the draw. But then I think, yeah, logistically, there's just a lot of stuff off the field, and I think the travel factor, and I just think the force have been in and around there um, for the for the games. I just think, yeah, um, until we, I can see them one up being, you know, one or two games, and they show more show more improvement. Just hard to pick them, so I'm gonna go the force. Highlanders got up against the Tars. You know, Tars, again, were relatively impressive. They were very good, statistically um, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, their chances at home against the Brumbies appear to be pretty good. Oh, yeah. I think the Hollands... I don't know what's up with the Brumbies. A little yeah. bit like the Crusaders. It's just very uncharacteristic, the way they're playing these games. Um, and, and you look at the team. It's not much shift. Yeah. Not much yeah. change. I, don't, I, I just don't know. The mojo just is not there. Mm. It was the same in uh, pre-season. They just, yeah. I don't know. The Brumbies just... And I think travelling... It's under the roof. You heard the um, after, after match interview straight away. They're like, we can't wait to get back to under the roof. You know, they just love playing there. So. Yeah. Highlanders view, Bryn? Yeah, I'm going the same. Yeah, I think a great result. Obviously, you know, would have been obviously wanted to have a, a little bit better in terms of the result, but in terms of the, the how much they won by. But to get a result in Sydney against the Waratahs for a team that probably hasn't won a lot in the last, you know, 12 to 24 months, it's a great result for them. And I think they'll continue to keep getting better, especially being at home with Petrol, Fakataba, AJ Falianga, I think was, was awesome when he came on and his injection. So, yeah, I think they're making some good um, inroads for the season with the Highlanders, so I'm going to pick them this week. OK, so I'm expecting you to go Chiefs v Drew. That's in Hamilton, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, if that was in Fiji, I'd pick them, but nah. <laughs> I don't get it done against the I mean. Chiefs for me. Chiefs for you. And the Tars versus the Blues. Blues. This is Blues, is it, but not a straightforward pick. No. No, not after last week, I don't think. Um, but I do think that bench situation played a lot and there's, mm. you know, it's more respect to the Canes that, as I said, they shut Stevie down quite well, who's been in good form. So um, it'll be interesting what the team looks like. Do those players, because they're both key players, do they pass the HI2, HIA2 mm. and 3 to allow them to play? If not, um, it'll be interesting to see the makeup of the teams. It's definitely 50-50, I think, but yeah. I'm just being honest, I will pick the yeah, Blues. because you love the Blues. <laughs> Bryn, you don't... Former Blues player, but not the same love of the Blues. <laughs> I think we've done this podcast for five years now. I don't think Jip's ever gone against the Blues ever in five games. But I am open years, about so. that I'm never going to do it. I will be factual, <laughs> just like I picked the Blues yeah. against the Manawa, but yeah. I said the Manawa will win. Yeah. But I'm picking the Blues. Have you picked against the All Blacks? <laughs> no. You haven't? I don't think so. Bryn's picked against the All Blacks. Oh, you have once. Yeah, as you have once. We have. Did I pick. I think, I think we did once in South Africa. Oh, and then they won. And then they won. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you're never going to do that again. Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, call, we'll call you the motivator, yeah. James Parsons. Well, I tell you what, I've motivated the Tars. <laughs> Darren Coleman will be <laughs> calling me directly if they win this weekend. <laughs> Good lord. No, Bryn, I'm, I'm, I'm going blues. You're going blues. You're going blues. Okay, right here. Okay. Well, that's that sorted. Um, please get on board with our tipping comp at tipping.super.rugby. And uh, hey, if you can beat Delta Hurricanes, who's currently on 15 over the course of 16 weeks, you're going to be a pretty damn good picker because those picks on the weekend were Freakish. something else. Something else. So thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We've had lots of questions come in on the email and within uh, the YouTube comment section. Can't get to all of them, but we will try to throw them in as we go within the context of the conversations. We had questions about AI refereeing, <laughs> questions about identification process in New Zealand when England are taking all these young guys like Ethan Root, and questions about... 
the size of the bench, which I think is one we should get to next week when we've got a little bit of time, because it's a really interesting one from Drew Muir. So we'll get to that as soon as we can. Thank you very much for joining us on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. You can catch us on all Sky platforms. You can catch us on YouTube. You can catch us on Rugby Pass. Rugby Pass TV as well from this week onwards. So that's another platform for you to get us on on your television. Mm. So expanding as much as we can. Thank you very much to James Parsons. Thank you, Ross. Once again, appreciate your time. And to Bryn Hall as well. Thank you, mate. All the best. And he's out. <laughs> and we're out. Thank you very much for joining us. Mate